Now, John chapter 15, John chapter 15, uh, and I uh, want to uh, begin reading here in verse number 12, John 15 and verse 12. These things have I spoken unto you, the Savior said, that my joy might remain in you. Now, Christianity is a faith of joy. Uh, and because of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is it not so? Well, we'll see some things today that might help us toward that end. But he said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. First part of verse 12 said, This is my commandment. Now, that immediately strips the joy from a lot of people. Now, wait a minute here. I want to do what I want to do. You know, uh, Don't tell me it, uh, that uh, you want my joy to be full and then tell me what to do. <laughs> uh, by the way, the only way that that can be accomplished in our life, this joy in the midst of commandments, uh, is when our commandments come from the Lord. They must come from the Lord. They must be rooted in His Word. And so the Lord said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And so, Lord, we pray as we think about uh, this special relationship that begins with you by repentance and faith and salvation, may continue, Lord, uh, to deepen to the point of this friendship of which you speak in these verses. Lord, I pray that you will help us to examine ourselves for the true characteristics of friendship and not, our, uh, not allow ourselves to be deceived by the measure of our own mind. But may we be measured by the Word of God. And Lord, may we, in those areas where we fail, bring ourselves in line with you. Again, I pray this morning that you would help if there be one in our midst or more that are not yet saved, that today they would realize their need of Christ to be born again. And Lord, that they might do so even today before it's forever too late. Guide our thoughts today. Please, I pray, cleanse me of sin. Help me, Lord, I pray, to be filled with your Spirit and to preach your Word as it is in truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Interesting statements are found here, especially down in verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. I have called you friends. Now that should jump off the page to anybody that's interested in being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. We consider it an honor, at least in our heart and mind, and humbly so, to be considered a servant of the Lord. And we ought to want to serve Him. But he says here our relationship with Him can be deepened to the point of, of friendship uh, and service from uh, the approach of friendship. We can be more and we are considered more, or we should say desired to be more than merely a servant with Christ. And uh, so we can enjoy a close, personal friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think to some degree we might want to let that thought soak in for a moment. Uh, because we very often fall prey to the the rote movements of religion, that our God is away off over yonder somewhere, and we know Him, and He knows us, but that we're just doing the best we can till He comes, gets us, and takes us to be with Him. The fact of the matter is that God desires much more than that from us. And it's something that is a fulfilling desire of uh, uh, every believer. Friendship with Christ is not something that's reserved only uh, for uh, the uh, famous, if you will, the celebrity of the Bible, like Abraham. Uh, I mean, the Bible says who, uh, he believed God uh, and uh, he was considered, therefore, or called the friend of God, was Abraham. Such the standing, again, uh, with the Lord is the worthy pursuit of every believer. 
Uh, the Bible tells us in James 4 and 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Those are not just words. Those are the promise of the God of heaven. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And this promise uh, is indicated in our Lord's words right here in our text in verse number 15. Uh, when he says, uh, again, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. There is this special illumination, this special revelation, not outside the Bible revelation, like some believe, but just the simple knowledge of God and his will for our life and his direction from day to day. God, because of his desire to befriend us, has provided direction for us and help and strength and guidance all along the way. Matter of fact, if you'll look back at chapter 14 here down in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And so there is the special presence of the Lord upon those who love God uh, and obey his word. And we'll see this morning that uh, as part of the message, uh, that love is always connected to obedience. Obedience to uh, the Lord. And so as you uh, seek this type of status... Uh, we need to uh, uh, examine ourselves as to our progress. Uh, there are a lot of folks that uh, consider themselves friends that may, after having looked at the biblical definition of what it means to be a friend of the Lord, may realize there are some areas of store, uh, uh, shoring up I need to accomplish in my life if I really want to be a friend of the Lord. Because uh, this passage down through the end of uh, the uh, chapter uh, explains to us how we demonstrate this friendship. How we demonstrate this friendship. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 and 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. There's a lot of people talking about how cold other people are when they're cold themselves. Uh-oh, you didn't expect me to get started that early, did you? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, if you want friends, you've got to show. And that word show has the idea of demonstrate yourself. It, it has to go beyond words. Uh, you know, um, we live in a day of uh, entertainment and everybody's focused on celebrity and all that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, for some people, it's the greatest joy in life. Uh, just to be able to see some celebrity or something, maybe to be in the receiving line of a politician or something. But shaking a celebrity's hand or seeing a celebrity in person does not mean that I'm a friend of that celebrity. It doesn't mean that that celebrity is a friend of mine. Matter of fact, they don't even care who you are, as long as you keep buying tickets, as long as you keep casting votes. That's all in the world they're worried about uh, many times. Not all the time, but many times that's the case. And uh, matter of fact, I was doing some other reading along another line uh, this, um, this last week. And uh, I was reading about uh, an occasion. It's a, apparently a famous picture now where uh, some movie star was supposed to go to some event. And uh, everybody heard about it. And so they gathered outside the venue to try to catch a glimpse of this movie star. And uh, as the uh, movie star came down the sidewalk, there was a bunch of excitement and everybody was, uh, uh, you know, uh, thrilled to be able to have this opportunity. And a photographer from somewhere happened to look at the crowd that was trying to look at the celebrity. And he noticed that everybody in the crowd, instead of watching the celebrity, was doing this. Living through their phone instead of living in reality. There's a message there in that somewhere. But, uh, but anyway, standing in that line and taking a picture, that celebrity did not make um, <laughs> them that celebrity's friend. Matter of fact, apparently in this image, I didn't get a chance to take a look at the image, but there's an, uh, an older person there that was watching the whole thing and just grinning. And it was such a, uh, such a verbal description to me of our society. 
our young society going around zombies to their telephones and the old people looking at them and just going, what in the world is going on here? You know? <laughs> Uh, but look, we want to be genuine friends of the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many professing believers are guilty of being name droppers. Yeah, the Lord's my friend. I know the Lord. And the, you ever been around somebody like that? Um, one of the most uh, 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 difficult uh, conversations for me is to be in the presence of preachers, and all they want to talk about is what other preachers they know. In an effort to try to uh, impress you uh, or some other thing, they start dropping names. Happens to you at work, too, I'm sure, in some place or another, where folks are trying to impress others. And, and I'm afraid that a lot of times believers are the same way. We drop the name Jesus all the time as if we are a close acquaintance with him. When in reality, we, there may very well be some distance between us and him. You know, kind of like the seven sons of one Sceva, the Bible talks about in Acts chapter number 19, uh, who were trying to cast out demons, and they said, we adjure you by Jesus, there's a name drop, uh, at whom Paul preacheth, there's another name drop. The Bible says, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are ye? <laughs> and so they were thinking that by the dropping of some names, they were going to have some kind of special power. Ezekiel put it this way in chapter 33 and verse 31. He said, they come unto thee as, as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. In other words, a lot of times there's a lot of love in our lips, but maybe not so much in our life, uh, even toward the Lord. We, uh, we learned, of, uh, as we heard from Proverbs uh, 18 and verse 24, that if we're going to have to have friends, we must show ourselves friendly. It's an action. It's a carrying out of. It is activity that demonstrates we are truly friends of God. We've got to go beyond declaring friendship to demonstrating friendship if we expect anybody to believe what we're saying uh, and to go further, expect to have any real spiritual impact on the lives of others. There are evidences in our lives that prove or disprove our claim to friendship with Jesus Christ. And the Bible talks about these here. Uh, several of those we'll give you this morning in the time that we have. And first of all, he says to us, you know, how am I going to demonstrate? By the way, a faith kept to ourselves is of no good in the world. We need to have a faith that reaches out and touches others. We need to have a faith that impacts the hearts and minds and lives of others. Uh, it, it is not for us to be to ourselves with God because God has left us here for the purpose of being a shining light for him. And so part of that is by our life and by our demonstration of this friendship. Our friendship with Christ should impact, of course, the way that we live. And so we demonstrate one of the first demonstrations that the Lord mentions here of genuine friendship with him is that of love. In verse, uh, in verse 12 of John 15, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another uh, as I have loved you. In verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. Now, he, he immediately gets right to the challenging point. It's easy for us to say, I love the Lord. But it's more difficult for us to say that I'm genuinely loving the brethren. He tells us clearly that the demonstration of our love for him is expressed in our love for his people. And our, uh, and our uh, uh, willingness to have ministry toward them. Uh, certainly the, the Christian who abides in Christ ought to be able to love the believers. Love believers. Now here's the thing with this before we ever get started, and that is this. Uh, we want people to be lovable before we love them. You know what that makes us, don't you? Hypocrites. 
Because the Bible says that when we were yet sinners, the Lord loved us, see, uh, and gave his son to die. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we are commanded to love one another. Now, hold your place in John 15, and for our church family, you'll know that maybe we'll get back there. 1 Peter chapter number 1, and down in verse 22, Peter speaks of this love. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, in this particular verse, you find two uses of the word love. That first use of the word love comes from the well-known Greek word Philadelphia. It is a brotherly love. It is an affectionate love, if you will. Uh, it is a familial, and what I mean by that is family love. We know it. We feel it. Uh, and, uh, it's, you know, uh, somebody has said siblings can fight like cats and dogs, but the, as soon as somebody from the outside picks on one sibling or the other, the fight is on. Why? Because of family love. Family love. That's the idea, if you will, of that first use of the word love. Unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love. That is the word agape. That is the love of God. You want to get the most out of your family love, there needs to be a heavenly love engaged. This agape love is an act of the will. We love because it is the right thing to do. And then the uh, enjoyment of it comes later. But it is an act of the will. So the path to brotherly love is godly love first. Here's what's happening with a lot of people. Maybe a lot of you, maybe some of you, you don't use the word a lot, uh, but maybe some people are, are, are hoping to be loved without loving. You've got it all backwards. You invest in love and then you reap on that investment. You choose to love others and then you reap what you sow. See? Uh, and so uh, the idea here is then that the path to brotherly love is godly love, and the key to affection is intention. Uh, two, we spend too much time worried about how we feel instead of worrying about what we ought to be doing and, uh, and uh, the attitudes we ought to have. And then we wonder how come when we, we, if we operate based upon how we feel or emotion, and, and because we don't have the emotion, we don't carry out the intention, then the end result is that we never have the emotion. It, it's a terrible cycle of neglect by choice. Well, uh, so someone says, when you, uh, so, someone says often on this, look, you can't command one person to love another. Oh, yes, you can. Well, how do you know? Because Jesus did. Jesus did it. He said... He, he, a matter of fact, he used the word, this is my commandment, John 15, uh, John 15 and verse number 12, that you love one another. He didn't say this is my suggestion. He didn't say this would be great if you could figure this out. He said, this is my commandment that you love one another. That's it. And so now <laughs> uh, the scripture defines that a little further when it says that we speak the truth in love. You know, some, especially our society today, which is creeping into our churches today, they have the idea that loving is just accepting everything. But true love speaks the truth. It does it lovingly. If we love people, we are truthful. Uh, and uh, so uh, we, uh, we need to be intentional in that, we're told here. That... Um, that, uh, f that uh, uh, family love is produced by a godly love. And so love, we see demonstrated with God, the love of God, John 3, 16, love, 
is based on an act of the will. We already gave that to you from Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. His love toward us. Get this. God expected nothing from us. See, we love whenever we think we're going to get something back from it. That's not the way God first loved us. Now, when we're saved, that love comes back to God, and we're seeing here that it should come back toward our brethren, but we love first as an act of our will. I'm going to love. And so our love for the brethren, we're told, is an evidence of our salvation. And John, uh, back in uh, John 13, John 13, uh, and uh, back there in verse 35 uh, just uh, two, two chapters ahead of our text, of course. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. No wonder the world's confused when they see the church bickering and fighting and hating one another. How, that's not the demonstration of the love of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, uh, this love is uh, evidence of our salvation. And not only is our love for the brethren the evidence of our salvation, our love for the brethren is an evidence of our love for Christ. Uh, look in your Bible at Matthew, Matthew 25. Matthew 25 and verse 35 Matthew 25 and 35, the Lord said, For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or... Uh, naked and clothe thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto him, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Uh, again, a whole uh, mentality of ministry that Christians need to grab hold of. That when we minister to others, we are ministering to Christ. When we demonstrate love to others, we are demonstrating our love first for the Lord by that ministry. And so it is an evidence of our love for Christ. Here's, here's what the Lord is, uh, is boiling down for us. Uh, and uh, that is this, that uh, you and I cannot say that I am a friend of God if I do not love the people of God. Now I want you to think for a minute about your relationships with the saints. What do those look like for you this morning? What, what, what uh, uh, you, you know, what, uh, if you had to put a measure on it, what would it be? Are they satisfying? Are they enjoyable? Or, or maybe something otherwise? The Lord said we cannot be the friend of God without loving the people of God. Uh, to, uh, to, to grab a couple of illustrations on this, go to 1 John with me, if you would, please. 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 9. 1 John 2 and 9. Somebody said, why in the world do you call verses that meantime? Well, because that's what they taught us in Bible college, number one. Number two is because many people don't catch it until about the third time. So let me say it again. First John, that'll make four. That may everybody be there. First John, chapter number two and verse nine. Look, he that saith he is in the light. That means, you know, God is light. The idea here, you're walking with God. You're in fellowship with God. You know God. So he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Now watch out because you get a lot of people say they know God, but they don't need no church house. Well, that's not Bible. That's not Bible. They're in darkness until now. And so uh, he that, uh, where, where was it? Verse number nine. He that saith he's in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light 
and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. You know one of the things that a, that a dislike, if you will, or a hatred for the brethren will do? It'll blind you. Um, from knowing the direction you ought to be going in life. From knowing God's direction for your life. Look, uh, let's focus on verse 10 for a minute. The genuine believer loves intentionally. We've already said that. Uh, but uh, in verse number 10, he says this, He that loveth. Again, that is, that, that is the word agape. It is an intentional act of the will, a direction of the will. So the genuine believer loves intentionally as a direction of the will. And this is demonstrated from this verse by two lifestyle choices. You're going to get them right here out of verse number 10. One, if I love uh, if I love as I should love, if I love the brethren as the Bible says I'm to love them, if I love them as the way Christ loves me and loves them, I will be, first of all, abiding in righteousness. You see it there in verse number 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in what? The light. That pictures a life of holiness that pictures a life of uh, fidelity. It pictures a life of faithfulness to God. If I really love the brethren, I will, I will choose to be abiding in righteousness. The word abiding means to, uh, to stay, to remain, to be steadfast. It means to persevere. And so God said, if we really love the brethren... Uh, we're going to live according to the truth of God's word. Now watch this. Uh, many times we, we know this inherently because of the, uh, the Holy Spirit of God in our heart after we're saved. But we know we ought to live in holiness because God said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We want to be holy in life because we want to be like our Savior. This verse reminds us that a secondary a purpose for living in righteousness is for the sake of the brethren. If you really love the saints, you will consistently persevere in the light. You will walk according... See, here's the thing. You can't say you love the brethren and rebel against God. You don't love the brethren. Because if you did love the brethren, you'd persevere in righteousness. For the sake of the impact of your testimony and your life. And, and this is to be consistent. That's what the word abide means. It means to persevere. And it's also connected to our love of the saints. You see that even here in verse number 6 of chapter 1. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God. Oh, wait a minute. We have fellowship one with another. Isn't that something? And uh, look, an out of sorts brother or sister in Christ is not going to have right fellowship with the saints. That's what God said. And so it is connected with our fellowship. You want to love the brethren the way you should and have fellowship with the brethren the way you should? Then you walk in the light. You walk in the light. And so um, uh, we're reminded here then that one of these two lifestyle choices of a genuine believer seeking to love the saints as God has told us to will be that they are abiding in righteousness. The second choice, lifestyle choice, will mean connectedly that they will be avoiding the scandalous. Watch now. Abiding in righteousness and avoiding the scandalous. If you look at verse 10 again of 1 John 2, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. This occasion of stumbling translates a Greek word from which we get our word scandal. Scandal. Uh, and the word means to trigger. That's a common word today, isn't it? Everybody's triggered. 
Have you noticed that? And so here's what he's saying. We'll be careful not to be a negative trigger in somebody's life, an unrighteous trigger in somebody's life. We're going to abide in righteousness. We're going to avoid the scandalous. Let me tell you something again, brethren. It does matter how you live. It does matter what your testimony is with the saints. You can't say, well, I just don't care. I'm just going to be me. Oh, please don't. Unless that you is in the Spirit. In which case, you will avoid the scandalous in your life. A couple of thoughts on this. this uh, as it came to my mind, thinking about that word trigger. I can scandalously trigger the brethren emotionally in a couple of ways. First of all, I can negatively trigger them when I live in pride. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. This contention that the Bible refers to is first an attitude before it's an action. It is an air. Uh, it is an environment. It is an aura. It is an atmosphere. And we see that in Acts 15 and verse 39 uh, when this uh, contention came between Paul and Barnabas where the Bible says in the contention uh, between Paul and Barnabas was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Notice a couple phrases here. First of all, he mentions contention, and then he says between. Paul is an, ent Paul is an entity. Barnabas is an entity in the air between. There is this contention. It's not an action. Paul didn't throw hymnals at Barnabas. Barnabas didn't lash out or strike out at Paul. But there was this something in the air between them, between them. It is an atmosphere, if you will. And it may be that some of you have continual problems with the brethren because your pride is like a blast wave careening ahead of explosions fire. Your pride just emanates. It goes before you. Before any other thing happens. Your, your ego lingers in the atmosphere like an off-putting, noxious stench. It is, it is a hovering filth. Not so much unlike that of Charlie Brown's friend, Pigpen. It creates an immediate distance between you and others before words or actions ever commence. Pride. I trigger the brethren by pride. Negatively. I, 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 trigger, I trigger them negatively emotionally. Um, but then also, I can scandalously trigger the brethren, not just by pride, but by presumption. And by the way, pride presumes upon the space of others. It invades the space of other people because it is so self-oriented. Presumption is a flagrant disregard of courtesy or propriety and an arrogant assumption of privilege. It's entitlement. It is a root of pride. You continually presume upon the kindness and grace of others, and uh, you expect others to be right and do right, even while you live arrogantly, selfishly, pridefully, condescendingly, disdainfully serving self. This was the attitude of Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminent. And, but here's the thing. Diotrephes sinned against the brethren because he, he presumed upon their kind graces. 
It's an evil wickedness. Presumption. And it triggers the brethren. Uh, j- just like a uh, pig pen's aura, it keeps people distant from you. you look, I, I don't want to get into the new age or anything like that. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Uh, you, you put off a certain vibe. You do. Everybody does. And, uh, we- and the thing is, your vibe... <laughs> I used to play guitar, and one of the, one of the ways we'd tune our, our guitar was to tune it by harmonics. Rather than, you know, using the strings, you play a harmonic and you tune it that way, and the strings kind of get all in, all in jive with each other. <laughs> and uh, it's a great way to tune your guitar, but here's the thing. See, you're tuned to yourself. And your vibe, boy, you just think it's all there. Everything's going good with you and Jesus. The problem is you don't even recognize you're out of tune with the saints. Uh, and uh, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're, 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 you're playing your own tune. You're, what do they call it, beating your own drum or something like that? I'm not sure what it is. But you understand what I'm saying? Presumption. And you just expect that everybody should just welcome that and give you the honor that you think you deserve. But in reality, what happens is because of that uh, atmosphere that you create, people avoid you. I'm sorry. But that's exactly what happens. Therefore, listen, your fellowship is not as it should be. Because you're out of tune by presumption. Presuming upon the... uh, By the way, all driven by self which is not biblical love. Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, ye, uh, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not your liberty for an occasion of the flesh. That's the idea here. So I have this liberty because of the good graces of others, right? And I'm going to use it for an occasion of the flesh. Take advantage of that to get my way, to intimidate, to push around. You see what I'm saying? That's not Bible love. Because he says, don't use it for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. I can scandalously trigger the brethren emotionally by pride and presumption, just as two examples. Uh, But then I can also scandalously trigger the brethren behaviorally. Behaviorally. You see, uh, unlike the trigger of our day, and we mentioned everybody's triggered, Unlike the trigger of our day, of which we're warned, lest we make people uncomfortable in unrighteousness, which we should trigger them to righteousness. The trigger of 1 John 2 and verse 10 always denotes in the Bible an enticement to conduct which could ruin the person in question. When we preach in our day on these various lifestyle choices, and there are so many of them now, and it triggers people, it should tri- and they need space safe, but they need trigger free spaces now. I'm going to tell you one thing: when it comes to being moved from unrighteousness to righteousness, a trigger free space will not help you. It won't help you. We need to be challenged in our thinking to bring it biblical. Amen. It is a trigger, this trigger in 1 John 2.10, this scandal, if you will, this, this um, occasion of stumbling, will be a trigger to their unrighteous undoing. And there are several ways in which we can do this. We'll give you three of them quickly by way of illustration, and then we'll close. We can, we can trigger, we can trigger the, the brethren behaviorally to impurity. And Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verses 6 through 13 where he's talking about this, this liberty that certain brethren had to, have to, to eat meat unto idols. And he said to them, if the weaker brethren see you doing that, they're going, are, are they not going to be emboldened to eat meat? Uh, to eat meat? That's the action. Your liberty is going to cause somebody 
uh, to fall into that which is disobedience to God. You, and that's not love. That's not Bible love. Bible love uh, demonstrates a life that has none occasion of stumbling in him. Okay, again, I'm going to say it does matter how you live. It matters. You cannot. We have got to stop this thing. People say, well, you shouldn't be judging me. Nobody's judging you except God. There is a right, there's a wrong, there's a holy, there's an unholy, and you need to choose the right and the holy. Stop blaming the brethren because you have a bent to impurity. By the way, people say, well, that church didn't just love me the way they should, so I just never went back. Great, that's going to help you. That's going to help you. We, we can trigger uh, the brethren uh, to behavioral impurity. We can trigger the brethren, again by way of illustration, to behavioral treachery. All right, let's move a little closer to the Lord and talk about the apostles. And there's Peter, and Jesus has been crucified and dead. And Peter says this, I go a fishing. And the other brethren said, we're going with you. He triggered their disobedience to the Lord. Let me tell you something. I'll just say it. If you're hanging around somebody that's constantly got some kind of Debbie down about Maranatha and about this, that, and the other, if you think that's not going to affect you, you got another thing coming. Worse than that, somebody that's down on the church and down on the Bible and down on Christians and down. You better get away from that. Because those kind of people will trigger you to treachery. Uh, uh, interestingly, as it relates to Moses, uh, Moses trying to lead those people out, and he was burdened trying to bring them along, and they kept provoking and provoking, and finally Moses lost his temper and struck the rock and got banned from the promised land. And then we read in Psalm 106 and verse 32, they angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sake. They triggered Moses. It doesn't mean that Moses shouldn't have chosen the right way, obviously, to obey God. But the brethren uh, provided an occasion of stumbling for him. We can trigger them to idolatry. We can trigger them to treachery behaviorally. And then we can trigger them to behavioral hypocrisy. Look at Galatians 2, and we're wrapping up. Galatians 2. Those first two illustrations were more easily laid out for you than this one that we'll read together. Galatians chapter number 2 and in verse number 9. Galatians 2 and 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, uh, of course the apostles there, perceived the grace that was given unto me, They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. Amen. That we should go unto the heathen, that's the Gentiles. By the way, (laughs) uh, every unsaved person is a heathen. Now somebody's not going to like that, but I'm going to tell you, uh, there's a whole bunch of former heathens sitting in here this morning. Jesus won what makes the difference. Amen. And so that we should go to the heathen, that's the Gentiles. Where in the world was I? Uh, and verse, last part of verse number nine. And they under the circumcision, that's the Jews. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Uh, Peter's fellowshipping with the Gentiles. But when they were come, those that came from Jerusalem, those that came from James, the Jews, and uh, you know there was this animosity between the Jews and the Gentiles that was supposed to be erased in Christ. He made of two 
uh, of twain, I should say, one. So there's no more Jew, no more Gentile, just Christian. Amen. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself. From where? From the Gentiles. Because those holy Jews were there. Okay, hold on. You want to see this in action? Go to an independent Baptist preacher's meeting. (laughs) Boy, y'all didn't like that, did you? Yeah. Yeah. And they put on one air in one place and a whole nother air in another. So... He said, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. (laughs) When you find somebody whose standards change based upon the company they're with, you better watch out. Verse 13, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. And these saved Jews that had gotten brought in together with the Gentiles. Now they're having a problem. Watch. In so much that Barnabas uh, also was carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas, the son of consolation. Listen, the one that took the one that the whole church was afraid of and brought him as a believer into the church and said, Brethren, we should welcome this man Saul who later became Paul. The same one that was conciliatory now was controversial. Why? Because of the pressure, the triggering of wayward mindsets among the saints. You see it? If I'm not careful, I can trigger the brethren uh, behaviorally right into hypocrisy. That's what dissimulation means. In other words, they were one way in front of one group and another way in front of another. That's hypocritical. They had lost their consistency. So what am I saying here as we close? Too many. He's saying, he's talking about our our behavior, our treatment. How do we love the brethren? Um, Too many Christians... Live like people that text while they drive. Which is an increasing epidemic in our society. Matter of fact, right here locally, I think I told you, we normally have about, uh, I guess in previous years, somewhere around the neighborhood of uh, 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 800 wrecks a year in York County, I think is what it was, car wrecks. We had 400 before the mid-year point this year. Uh, according to what I read, if I remember the numbers correctly. The point is this. There's been a huge increase in the number of vehicle accidents, primarily that are the result of distracted driving. All right? Despite it being illegal. Have you ever driven somebody, by somebody, uh, and you hurry up and get around them because you can tell when you're behind them? I did it all the way back in Tennessee. That person's on their phone. Get around They're on the phone. Get away from them. They're not safe. Hold on. They're not paying attention. Get away. (laughs) All right. Um, uh, And so you drove by me. And don't they know that's illegal? Matter of fact, one study found, and it doesn't work, does it? It's illegal, number one. There are fines, number two. All right. Doesn't matter. Sounds a whole lot like Christianity. There are rules. But apparently they don't matter. Anyway, the result of one study came out and said that the states that have the strictest laws have the worst problems. Here's why. Because instead of fixing the problem, it just causes more people to hide it. So if you're not supposed to be looking at your phone while you're driving, they start putting it down where you can't see it. Now they're really looking away from the road. Ain't that something? Hmm. It's illegal. And so somebody put it this way. If laws, police enforcement, and fines cannot stop texting and driving, the solution must in the end become bloody. And it is. 
Graphic ad campaigns show just how fast a careless driver can text and drive. And statistics say at 55 miles an hour, you look down for five seconds or whatever, and you've gone the length of a football field unaware of your surroundings. And so they show just how fast a careless driver can text and drive. Unspeakable destruction, this is his words, into the lives of others. Uh, public service announcements reenact collisions in slow motion with the, with the shattering of the glass and the crumpling of the metal and the tossing of human bodies. Those ads tap, here it is, to the real cause of texting and driving, a lack of awareness of the flesh and blood. We speed past every day. And it describes exactly the way some Christians live. Completely unaware of what their failure to love is doing in destroying others. Jesus said, look, he said, this is my commandment, that you love one another. If your love, if whatever level it's at, uh, this morning, does it demonstrate in reality a friendship with Christ or more with self? Let's stand together, please, and bow our heads.